What is a marriage for? Is it a straight jacket to ensure that we become serious adults? What is a marriage for? Is it a societal construct, a learned practice that works well most of the time, but is basically flawed and based on impossible ideals? What is a marriage for? Is it God's design for men and women to find true freedom within an exclusive friendship, to find security and contentment, to learn to properly love and trust? Now, in all I say today, don't miss this, in all I say today, let's not sit here judging one another. God is the judge. And yet he can also be our saviour, our forgiver, our restorer. There's always hope in Jesus. Remember that. And the seventh commandment says, you shall not commit adultery because it's the breaking of a bond. It's the betrayal of trust. It's the throwing off of the most solemn promise we can make to another person. Now, increasingly during my lifetime, the Western world has, has winked at adultery. It's been put on a list of prohibitions that the supposedly exciting people, the risk takers, dare to break. And yet in that same Western culture that tolerates adultery and occasionally even celebrates it, no one is forced into marriage in the first place. Now, some joke flippantly about their marriage. They say, 30 years I've been married. You get less than that for murder. You ever heard that before? You ever heard people say that? I've heard se several people say that to me. Uh, but marriage isn't supposed to be compared to imprisonment. Marriage isn't supposed to be compared to imprisonment. It's really giving up one kind of freedom for another kind of freedom. Now, six months ago, late in the evening, I had this thought, and I wrote it down on a piece of paper nearby. And this is the quote. And I put down, to some it sounds like a shackle, but it's actually very freeing. I have my own friend, and we're committed to each other for the rest of our lives. What an amazing design from our Lord God. Marriage isn't supposed to be compared to imprisonment, but instead it's compared to another of the many ways in which we can trust God's plan for our lives, which bring him glory. Now Joseph is an example of righteous living in the face of his boss's wife, continually intending on being adulterous. <coughs> Maybe you've got your Bibles open in Exodus 20. I'm going to turn a few pages back to Genesis chapter 39. You might remember this when we were doing it as a series through Genesis and through Joseph's life. And this is him as a slave, but in some ways a servant, a very privileged person. And he was promoted. <coughs> But it says there in uh, Genesis 39, this is on page 44, if you've got it in your church Bibles, uh, halfway through verse 6, it says, Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Though he, she spoke to Joseph, day after day he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. Do you see there? 
Joseph knew that it wasn't only a sin against other people, which is bad enough, but far more, it's a sin against God himself. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God, he says. So the Bible declares that it does matter how we live. It does matter. It does matter how we treat others. And it does matter especially, most of all, what God sees and knows. Although this commandment is a prohibition, you shall not commit adultery, we need to think about how we will keep this commandment. The simple and positive way to say this is be faithful. Okay? So sometimes in, in teaching children we might just say this, when it comes to this seventh command, we say, be faithful, be faithful to your spouse, to your marriage partner, be faithful. But we really need to look at why our beliefs about marriage affect our whole lives. This is a very familiar passage. We're going back to the second chapter of the Bible, Genesis 2 and verse 24. Page 5 of the Church Bibles. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. And this is where the Lord God has made the woman from the rib of Adam, the man, and brought her to him to be his wife. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. It's God ordained, even though there's no other person on earth, it's the two of them together, they're still married. God ordained one man, one woman. It's exclusive, it's lifelong, it's to be all about commitment and love. And sacrifice and whatever else it entails. When we get married, there are new things. There's a new name, particularly for the for the wife. Normally, she'll take the husband's surname. Often, there'll be a new home to move into, and there'll be privileges as well. The provision that the woman doesn't have to worry about the provision the man himself should be providing that and he himself the security of he himself now earthly marriage is to be a picture of Christ and his church and so I'm turning over to Ephesians in chapter 5 But this is really spelled out for us, page uh, 1176 in the Church Bibles. <clears throat> and it says there, Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. 
This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Can you see it there? That this picture, Christ and his church, the picture of how we are to be in our own earthly marriages. So I'll ask you this question. Do you believe in the headship of Jesus? Do you believe in the headship of Jesus? Or do we argue with him? Do we seek to compromise? Do we seek to get our own way? If we have an unbiblical view of earthly marriage, we're also more likely to have an unbiblical view of how we are to live as Christians, that we can manipulate the Lord as well. The bride of an earthly husband submits and is completely faithful because of the pattern already set by Christ with his bride, the church. The husband of an earthly bride loves deeply and is completely faithful because of the pattern already set by Christ with his bride, the church. I hope this passage has made that clear. God's design of marriage to be one man, one wife for life in an exclusive union. It is to be a picture of our relationship as part of Jesus' church. Now, Jesus re-emphasised the sanctity of marriage when he was asked about the subject of divorce in Matthew 19 and Mark 10. We won't go into that now. But Jesus went further, much further. You know, I said earlier, it does matter how you live. And yet more than that, Jesus revealed that it matters even what we think. That the act of adultery or any selfish act, it starts as a thought. And then it's nurtured in the heart. And Jesus broke the news to us that what the heart loves is just as important as what the body actually does. And we'll be judged by God for all of it. Look at it, it's Matthew chapter 5. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. This is page 969. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, I heard a story about this, a true, a true story. Um, you might have heard of Martin Lloyd-Jones, the doctor. And um, in, I believe uh, it was his first main pastor at the Sandfields, a um, short way from here. Uh, I can't remember if it was he or his wife came across this particular lady who came in his congregation who said, um, I, I, I did it, I did what was said in this verse. She had a patch over her eye, she'd actually gouged her eye out. It's perhaps pretty grim, isn't it? But she took this literally. Now the point is, we've got to act as if we had no right eye, if that's the one that causes us to sin, as it were. We've got to act as if we have no right hand if, we, if that's the thing that causes you to sin. It's not that we literally throw it away. It's that we act as if we don't have these things. What's leading us into sin? We've got to think about that. Well, in Psalm 119, you might know these verses. It says, how can a young man or a young woman Keep his way pure by living according to your word. 
And then he goes on two verses later in verse 11, says this, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And we might think, well, that's all well and good, but what are we to do? Because all of us have impure thoughts. All of us get it wrong, don't we? We sin in different ways. And this is where the, the gospel comes in with this wonderful sense of refreshing. And wow, this is exactly what we need. Another reference for you. I'm all over the Bible today. That's a good thing because I guess it's showing me, showing you the strength of what I'm saying. It's writ large right the way through the seam of the Bible. Here we are. It's in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6, 1147 if you're using a church Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and, and verse 9. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually or immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Don't miss this. This is saying, yes, that's your old life. That's been a God. You're washed now. You're cleansed. The gospel cleans. Good news for everyone. This is what some of you were. And this is the gospel. God's good news doing its amazing work. As the Holy Spirit comes upon people in, in one of the most sexually lax places uh, in the world here in, in Corinth. To transform them into people who love what is good. You see that? Who love what God loves and obey him with their minds and their hearts and their bodies. And maybe they are slow to learn and that's why he's having to write to them on this particular aspect. They haven't completely changed in their outward behaviour immediately. However, as far as God sees them, they are now translated into his family. They are washed. They are being sanctified. And they are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. People commit adultery because they think they will be fulfilled. But that's just one of Satan's many lies. So praise God for his desire for us to live godly lives. And for him giving us the power to live godly lives. In which we're truly fulfilled. And by which God himself is glorified and shown to be the most generous, wonderfully generous and kind and, and powerful God that he is. I hope you can see that. You know what you mentioned earlier, at the start of the sermon, about it being a straitjacket, how some people see a marriage and some people might even see the, the whole of, the, uh, of, of what we do in church and the gospel as a sort of straitjacket, something that, that is a shackle and a, and a bind but no it's all about the freedom in knowing God I hope you can see that today and you can't and ask the Lord to show you and so I firmly believe this and I hope you will as well that he will give us the strength to be faithful to him when we ask him for that strength and he will give us the strength to also be faithful to our spouse. So look to Jesus. Look to Jesus and his faithfulness to us. Utterly reject Satan's lies and build your life on God's truth. Let's pray together. Our Father God, we thank you that your word does not pull any punches, that it speaks to the heart of the issue and all the different things in our lives, the messy and murky areas uh, that we'd rather push under the carpet or pretty up. 
But Father, we thank you uh, that you know who we are. You made us and you know how deeply we fall into sin, thought, word and deed. And we pray, Lord, that we would see the, the wonder of your gospel, the fullness of it to redeem us. We thank you as well for the, the book of uh, the, the letter to 1 Corinthians being here, which we know written to a people who were really licentious. They, they, they came from such a, a deep and degraded place. And Father, you lifted them out of that pit of deprivation and you brought them onto the rock that is Christ. You pulled them out and you made them stand upon your truth and your word and your forgiveness and your newness of life. We thank you that we can also know that ourselves. We pray that we'd see freedom in Christ, in you and in all our relationships. For your sake, we pray. We pray that we would see your parameters as well, your fences and why you've put them there for our good and again for your glory. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen.